I want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to this week's virtual drasha. And this week we have the incredible opportunity, the incredible zuchos, to be able to begin the second book of the Torah, Chumash Mos. And Shmos in general is a fascinating sefer in that it's a transition. Whereas Sefer Bereshis is the story of the Avos and the Maos, the matriarchs and the patriarchs, Sefer Bereshis is really the story of individuals. Chumash Mos is the story of the maturation of a nation. Chumash Mos is the story of Kalal Yisrael. Again, we begin the beginning of Chumash Mos as just the slave nation, a group of individuals descended from Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, Sa, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. But as the Sefer progresses and as the story progresses, we are forged into an Am. We are forged into a nation. But of course, Parsha Shmos begins with the heartbreaking account of Egyptian servitude. Remember what began as an idyllic life in Egypt. Egypt originally opened its borders, it opened its land, it opened the economy to the Jewish people, welcoming the brothers of Yosef into Mitzrayim, unfortunately descends into a barbaric, torturous situation, where literally again, Jews were treated like animals, like beasts of burden, our babies thrown into the Nile, called Habein Hayilod Hayoora Tashlichuhu. And the Torah records something amazing. This is in Perak Bey's Pasuk Chav Gimel, Chapter 2, verse 23. Vahibayam Marab Mehmet Torah relates that the Paro, the Pharaoh, died. And ultimately, again, as a result of the death of the Pharaoh, Vayanchu B'nei Yisrael Min HaAvodah, the Jewish people, they cried out. They cried out because of the Avodah, because of the backbreaking labor. Vayizoku, again, we cried out. Vatal Shavasam Ele Elokim Min HaAvodah. And our cries ascended to Hashem because of the avodah, because of the difficult work. Vayishma Elohim es Nakasam, Hashem heard our cries. Vayiskar Elohim es Briso, es Avram Yitzchok in Yaakov. And God remembered His covenant, His covenant that He made with Avram Yitzchok in Yaakov. Vayar Elohim es Bnei Yisrael, God saw the Jewish people. Vayeda Elohim, and Hashem knew. And remember, right after this section, is the beginning of the story of Moshe Rabbeinu, or I should say, the beginning of the adult story of Moshe Rabbeinu. Beforehand, we learned about baby Moshe and his miraculous salvation from the Nile. But here, right after, the, the, we, this is the end of Parak Bay's the end of chapter 2. Parak Gimel begins with the episode of Moshe Rabbeinu shepherding his father-in-law's flock in the desert of Midian, quote-unquote, stumbling upon the burning bush. And it's at that moment that Moshe Rabbeinu is conscripted into the service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the service of Klav Yisrael. So the reason these psukim are incredibly important is because the Torah is telling us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu heard the cries. He heard the cries. And he was so moved by the cries of Klav Yisrael that he begins to turn the wheels of salvation. Again, Moshe Rabbeinu, it takes a little bit of time, but ultimately, again, salvation begins to pick up momentum after this event. And the Mepharsh in the commentaries all ask the same question. Remember, Kalal Yisrael have been enslaved for over 200 years. Over two centuries we've been enslaved. It's, that's, again, I should say, over two centuries we've already been in Egypt. But at least for a good 100 years, we've already been enslaved. We've been crying out. We've been buckling underneath the burdens. Our hearts were torn in a million pieces because of the dramatic losses. Why now is Hashem being moved by our cries? What happened now that's so different than what happened a day ago, a year ago, 10 years ago? We were also crying. 10 years before this episode, Jews were also buckling underneath their burdens. 20 years before this, Jews were also crying out because of the backbreaking labor. Yet for some reason, the cries of Klal Yisrael then didn't, quote-unquote, move Hashem, but now they do. Now they do. So the shail is what changed. So the Ramban Nachmanides explains so beautifully that at this point what the Torah is highlighting is Klal Yisrael prayed. There was tefillah from a broken heart. And there is nothing as powerful in this world as tefillah, as prayer, which emanates from a broken heart. Okay, fascinating. But again, it begs the question, their hearts weren't broken a year ago, two years ago, ten years ago, thirty years ago? So the Kliyakar comes along. And the Kliyakar explains so beautifully. Excuse me, the Arachayim. And the Arachayim HaKadosh explains, sorry, so beautifully, the Arachayim HaKadosh explains that they weren't praying at all. And in fact, if you look at the Chumash, if you look at the Chumash, the Torah doesn't record that they prayed. The Torah records that they cried out. They cried out. They cried out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the Lashon of the Arachayim, in the wording of the Arachayim. He says, just like a person, when they experience physical pain, they cry out. You stub your toe. 
you cry out. A child gets a shot, you cry out. I think, again, in Yeretzim, we'll, we'll all get the vaccine. I don't think anybody's going to cry out. I think if there are any tears, it's only going to be tears of joy. So the Arachayim says, the Pasuk doesn't say that they davened. It doesn't say that they prayed. It just says, ultimately, again, Vatal Shavasam, their cries ascended. Vayanchu, Vayizaku, Vatishma Naakasam. They didn't daven. They didn't daven at all. They were just crying out in pain. But it was those very cries of pain that moved, that propelled the Ribbono Shal Olam into dynamic action. But again, they've been crying out for years. They've been crying out for decades. They've been crying out day after day as a result of the inhumane conditions. Why now? And comes the Beis HaLevi. And the Beis HaLevi says something absolutely amazing. The Beis HaLevi says that when a person has to contend with ongoing difficult circumstances, after a while they forget everything else but how to survive. Persons undergoing tumultuous, difficult circumstances. A person must contend with suffering and tragic loss. The strongest, almost reflex we have, or the strongest instinct, is self-preservation, is survival. And a person could forget everything else about themselves and about their life and focus all of their energy simply on survival. It gives a good muscle. He says, you know, if you had a very wealthy man who lost all of his wealth, so in the beginning, let's say the first couple of days or even first couple of months after he loses his wealth, he's going to constantly be comparing his new circumstances with his old circumstances. So he's sitting in his hut, and again, he's looking at the thatched roof, and now it's raining and it's leaking inside. And, or he's sitting inside the hut, and he feels the wind coming through the walls. Or when he comes in and he kisses the mezuzah, he feels how flimsy the door is. And in every single moment, he looks around the house, he remembers his palatial estate that he used to live in. He remembers again the beautiful life that he had. And again, every single time he looks at what he is or what he has now, it's a reminder of what was. And when he sits down to eat his pauper's dinner and he's eating day-old bread and scraps from other people's tables, he's reminded about what he used to have the delicacies he used to dine on, the fine foods, the palate that he had developed over the years with all of his luxuries and physical pleasures. And every single time he takes a bite out of that coarse bread, he's reminded, it's hard to swallow, it's hard to get it down because he's reminded of what was. But the base Levi says something amazing. He says, but over time, something dramatic often occurs. The rich man will forget that he was ever rich. He'll forget that past life and he simply will become used to what is. Until a certain point in time, the thatched roof won't really bother him because that's my roof. And the wind swept home, that'll be just the norm of everyday living. And day old bread suddenly will not become all that difficult to get down because that's what I get used to. In other words, says the base Halevi, what happens with the rich man is when he loses his riches and he becomes a pauper, at a certain point in time, he stops thinking about the past because he's got to focus his energies on surviving the present. I can't think about who I was because I need to focus on surviving and where I am right now. That's the sole focus. That is the sole area of my attention. And says the Beis Halevi something absolutely amazing. Chumishmos begins, Ve'elishmos b'nei Yisrael. These are the names, ultimately, again, of the sons of Yaakov, Ruvain, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, so on and so forth, the names of the Shvatim. And those names are not just names, they represent identity. Do you know who we are? We are the children of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Sara, Rivka, Rachel. We are great. We are royalty. We are nobility. But then something happened. After 210 years of servitude, after 210 years of inhumane treatment and backbreaking labor, we had to focus all of our energy on surviving, on just survival, on just getting through the day to the point, says the Beis Halevi, that the Jewish people, they forgot who they were. We forgot Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, who, who what, 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 is, what does it matter? You know what matters? What matters is get my quota of bricks, get my food, go to sleep, 
and tomorrow repeat the same thing. Don't draw the ire of the Egyptians. Don't attract attention. Live underneath the radar. That's it. That's it. There's no identity. There's no nationality. We are beasts of burden. When it comes to my personalistic identity, and the base lady says something amazing. Cloud saw was on the cusp of forgetting who they were. They were on the cusp of forgetting their identity. They were on the cusp of forgetting that we are the descendants of the Avos and the Maos, and that each of us has a destiny, and that each of us has co-hosts, and that each of us is here in this world to make a difference. They were on the cusp of forgetting all of that. You see, the base lives, they didn't daven. You know why they didn't daven? Because in order to daven, you have to forge a personal bond with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Tefillah is a dialogical connection with the Ribbono Shalom. But in order to speak to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you have to feel that you are roi, that you are worthy of a relationship. If you don't feel you're worthy of relationships, at the end of the day, there's no there's conversation. Klal Yisrael didn't daven, says the, remember the base lady is called Arachayim. So Klal Yisrael did, they didn't daven to HaKadosh Baruch Hu because Tefillah requires a sense of self. Tefillah requires an eye awareness, as Rabbi Salavetia calls it. Tefillah requires that I understand that I am special. They were on the cusp of losing all of that. So there was no tefillah. They were just crying out in pain, just like an animal. If you go ahead and you wound an animal, it'll bray, it'll whatever, whatever it does. It'll, it'll let out a sound. Ultimately, again, expressing its pain. Clyde saw they didn't daven. Because davening requires a sense of self. Davening requires identity. Davening requires a sense of confidence. Davening requires a belief that you are worthy to dialogue with the Melech Machayim Lachim, the King of Kings. And they were on the cusp of losing all of that. And says the Beis HaLevi, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu realized that Klal Yisrael were about to lose their national and personal sense of self, if you lose your sense of self, if you forget that you are special, if you forget that you are unique, if you forget that you possess kohos, unique abilities and talents that make you, you, if you forget all of that, you simply disappear into the sands of time. And so the Ribbono Shal Olam understood, I have to quote-unquote act now. Because if I don't take them out of Mitzrayim now, they will lose their sense of self. They will lose that identity they will lose any semblance of that eye awareness and they will disappear into the sands of time. And so the cries rise up, not tefillos like the Ramban, but just cries of wounded human beings, human beings who are made to feel like animals, human beings who are on the cusp of losing their sense of self. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, I must intervene now or they will, or they will disappear forever. And I think the Beis Halevi, together with the Arachim, teach us an incredible life lesson. Because we all have challenges. We all have challenges. For some of us, our challenges are so intense that we must devote the totality of our energies to just simply staying afloat. I don't have koach for anything else. Just to simply get through the day. And for others, maybe my challenge is not so overwhelming. But still... It takes up a very large amount of my koach in various different ways. The thing we always have to be acutely aware of is that sometimes when we only become focused on survival, we forget who we are. You know, imagine if somebody were to stop you in the street and ask you a simple question. Who are you? Who are you? So many of us may define ourselves by our professions. Some of us may define ourselves by who we are related to. Okay, all, all true, those are components of our persona. But who am I? Who am I? And many times in life, we become so focused on keeping our head above water that we forget about who we are. Do we ever look in the mirror and say, hey, it might sound a little bit corny. You're great. You're special. You're unique. I am a child of the Avos and the Maos. I was put in this world because I matter. I was put in this world because some way, somehow, I have the ability to make it better. I don't know how. 
I don't, I don't know what my tachlis is. I don't know what my purpose is, what my mission is. But all I know is that God doesn't create things to take up space. So if I'm here, it's because I make a difference. Dear friends, so many of us walk through life and because our challenges sap us of all our energy, we forget these things. We lose our sense of self. We forget that we're special. And we forget that we possess kochos. We have a HaKadosh Baruch who loves us so much that in the moment when he saw that the scale was about to tip in an irreversible fashion, he intervened and he sent Moshe Rabbeinu to begin the process of Geula and to begin the process of personalistic rehabilitation. We have to sometimes take a step back in life a little bit and ask ourselves, who are we? Who am I deep down? Who, who, who am I? And maybe so much of my koach is just going to getting through the day. So much of my koach is just going to paying my bills and just making it, just keeping my head above water that I don't really think of myself as special. I don't really think of myself as unique. I don't really think of myself as contributing all that much. But dear friends, nothing could be further from the truth. The greatest strength the Jew possesses is a sense of self. We are descended from nobility. We are descended from the greatest men and women the world has ever seen. Their greatness is our greatness. And it's that greatness that courses through our veins in each and every moment. If I've spent a good part of my life directing all of my energies to keep my head above water, it's time to redirect those energies just a little bit and to truly rediscover who I am, what makes me special, what are my kochos, and what could I accomplish in this world. Wishing everyone a good and Erev Shabbos and a beautiful Shabbos Kodesh.